Sí, sí, sí. Somebody has to give us uh, the signal when to start. Ready, go. <laughs> <laughs> Must I? <laughs> Come on. Robbers. <laughs> yeah, good morning. Um, welcome to our session about the Ferdio fabric. We are here also in the Fair Digital Object Fabric uh, session, and we would like to talk about today how to shape the fabric. Um, we have currently five coaches. <laughs> here we see Rob. Zack is sitting over there. He's taking over from Rob in the, in the future. Lori, of course. Maggie, Maggie on the screen. <laughs> and I'm, I'm Rainer Schlotzka. So we will start today with a short introduction uh, about what are fair digital objects, because uh, I think we also have uh, guys in the room who don't know exactly what fair digital objects is. And Lori will start with an introduction, what the group is about and uh, what we are talking about, what the fair digital owes it. And afterwards we will have a small test. If you want to go into the coffee break, you have to pass a test, of course. <laughs> Um, and then we will have uh, three lightning talks about real implementations of your digital objects. And of course, we have time for sufficient discussion. So, but first, I would like to introduce Lori, giving the introduction. So, we need to change the screen. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Maybe you all know what's the fair digital object, but um, Maybe there are some newcomers. So at first I will give a quick introduction about our uh, IG and because the name of our IG is Fair Digital Object Fabric. So first uh, I, we need to talk about what's the concept of digital, a uh, fair digital object. Uh, we think a fair digital object is a representation of research data and other digital assets that contains all the information required for fairness. Uh, uh, our at first uh, used we are, our in, our IG's name used to be the data fabric, but there's some confusion about the name. Uh, people don't know what the data exactly mean in that uh, segment uh, uh, in it. So uh, we changed the name to fair data object fabric, and the data object is not just about the data. It can be applied to other uh, kind of digital assets. And for the for FDO, we talk about the data content. It can be the activity of the data content or some uh, link of the data content. And it's referenced to a PID, uh, which can identify the uh, data content. And there's uh, some other per uh, properties described the uh, described by metadata. For example, type maybe the uh, example part of the metadata. Uh, because if we have a tab, we can do some uh, actions according to the different types. And when we talk about FDO, we will uh, we make it a general concept. Uh, we can. Uh, it can be applied to many different uh, scenarios and we can use different technologies. But for this concept, uh, it's technology uh, agnostic. And we hope we, when we use FDO, we can make different kind of digital uh, assets interoperable and we will focus on the uh, harmonization of, the, of them. And we also want to uh, bridge different communities of data repository, different disciplines by the FDO. And uh, actually, uh, actually, there are different uh, implementations of FDO. Uh, it's, uh, it's very important to realize the eco uh, ecosystem of FDO. Uh, for example, uh, the PID kernel information of uh, 
data type registration or some others uh, outputs uh, from RDA or other communities. And one of the importance, uh, I think the importance of FDO and what our IG exists is to make them all work together. So after the concept of the FDO, uh, give, a, I'll give a quick introduction of our uh, IG. Uh, there's here's a link of our chapter. You can check this, it. Uh, it has been changed about two years ago uh, because our name has changed. And the uh, main aim of our IG is to co uh, coordinate uh, and give a platform for communication uh, between different uh, because different groups in RDA other communities to exchange their experience and. Uh, uh, implementations of FDO, and we also hope to give a platform for the users or some, um, some other people to know, uh, get a quick knowledge about FDO. Uh, so last year we start uh, work, uh, which is initiated by Maggie, uh, which is called Fair Deal for uh, Pedestrians, and we will collect the materials about FDO at that platform. And we also, maybe many of, of you uh, get involved in the FDO forum, and we hope we can get be a bridge between uh, RDA and the FDO forum. Uh, from all this, we hope to promote the creation of the ecosystem of reusable components and the portraits of FDO. I think the slides are out of sync. This is still the old uh, part, better. Oh, sorry. Uh, there are two more slides uh, about the operation of our IG. Uh, we have a regular we have regular meeting, uh, meetings every fourth Thursday of a month. And uh, in the meeting, some of them are working meeting talking about different uh, uh, concepts or some other things. And we also, uh, also have some project shares at the meeting. Uh, so far, there are already uh, 17 project shares at the meeting. Uh, we will have, they will show their uh, some researchers uh, uh, show their their their, uh, their implementation or some other work about FDO, and uh, you are very also well. Uh, we also welcome all of you to uh, share your work if there's something about FDO, about the components uh, implementation, or some use case or some other work. Please feel free to contact us, and uh, we hope we can see you in the. Uh, in the meeting uh, in the future. And we also connection some information about FDO and uh, hold some meetings such like this. And you can also find uh, uh, some FDO materials from this link. Uh, that's what I mentioned just now about the FDO for uh, pedestrians. And another thing, uh, we have just now, uh, Rina has mentioned that we have five uh, co chairs now. Uh, at the last plenary, we have four chairs uh, Maggie, uh, me, Rina, and uh, uh, Rob. But uh, there's so much work from, from now. He wants to uh, turn over to Zachary. So after this uh, plenary, we will have some, the new uh, co chair. So maybe Rock want to say something? So just very quickly, um, the last five years have been wonderful. It's almost five years exactly to the day that I took the role of co-chair. Um, I've been busy with so many things in RDA. I do plan to stay involved with the... Sorry. I, I do plan to stay involved with the uh, uh, Fair Deal Forum and other groups and watch this work closely. But I um, more than me talking anymore about my time, I'd like to welcome Zach Trout to the position. He, I think, is a a wonderful uh, replacement who's been in the community for several years and will uh, move the group forward in the proper way, I'm I'm sure. So this will be the last time I get to stand up here as a chair. I am I more than likely will do presentations in this group at some point in the future. Um, but uh, as of now, I'm done as co-chair. So Rob, um, so Rob. Thank you very much for your engagement. Five years in this group. That's really a tremendous work of 
uh, piece of work. Thank you very much for your contributions. And we know that that you are around whenever we are talking about fair digital objects in RDA. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Rob. And uh, here's uh, that's all the introduction of our interest group. And then we will go on the uh, we will have three presentations. And we will have uh, they will about uh, that they will be about the services, tools, or use cases about FDO. And maybe we have some quick questions after each of the presentation. So you want to introduce them? So I just. Lori, thank you very much for this introduction. <laughs> Before we are uh, opening uh, a couple of questions and so on, I think, Lori, there will be some questions for, uh, for the group. Um, please don't forget, here is a link to our collaborative notes. Also for us here in the room, the, the guys on Zoom, they already know it, that, that they could uh, register in our collaborative notes. So please also have a look at them. Register there with your name, affiliation, and email address if you like to. Of course, it's voluntary. and But also take care of the collaborative notes. Yeah. Are there any questions directly to Lori about the work in the group, progress in the group, criticisms, other comments? So currently not. Thank you again. Oh, um, uh, you need a microphone. Or use this microphone. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, yeah, it would be nice to have an overview of what, what the group has been doing for someone new. Yeah. I mean, I know you meet every, every, last Thursday of the month, but what, that's okay. I, I, I only know the, know, the, know the title, but I, I guess I guess you've been organizing things like this. Or what, what are some significant accomplishments over the last five years that you're proud of for the group? Please ask what the group's doing. What the group's doing. I'm new to the interest group. <laughs> that's it, yeah. We have five phones with all these people flying to the table. It's on. It's on. It's on. Uh, platform to for the researchers to uh, who are interested in FDO to exchange their ideas or share their projects projects or talk about the architecture and some how to build the uh, ecosystems of the FDO and uh, something like that and just not talk I think I give some sweet uh, main part of our work and give some links some information and some materials for the newcomers maybe uh, welcome you to come to our uh, meeting and maybe you should uh, you will get some some more information about our uh, group. Other questions, um, the guys who are online. If you have questions, please just raise your hand. So if not, we have afterwards. We uh, have long time for discussions and so on. So, oh, Maggie. I yes. don't see you. No, I turned my camera off uh, so that people would concentrate on the important things. No, so my comment would to the gentleman who just asked this question. So very much welcome to the group. Um, look forward to interacting with you. Um, the wiki pages uh, for that we, our group have uh, on the RDA website uh, do provide a, a pretty good summary of what we have been doing. Uh, ever since the, the interest group started, uh, albeit under this different name, which was called the Data Fabric uh, Interest Group earlier. So I would recommend uh, you to uh, visit there and uh, take a look. 
then uh, please join us at the next meeting and uh, we can engage in further dialogue. Thank you very much. Other questions? So if not, I would like to uh, introduce Andreas. Uh, Andreas will talk about, and now I need to look up his, the title of your talk. I don't find it. Oh, Andreas, introduce the title of your talk by yourself. Sorry. <laughs> ah, there it is. Conceptual model for a fair deal fabric. Exactly what we are talking about. Andreas? Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, so uh, my name is Andreas Pfeil. I'm working uh, at KLT for the HMC platform. Um, and I'm trying to um, give an overview of, about uh, what is needed for a fair deal fabric, what is needed for... Um, uh, what kind of services do we need and how uh, do they connect to each other? I will stay on a very um, rough level on this place. So if you are not familiar with it, so with a fairly old concept, uh, I hope it will still work out. And for the technical people, uh, I'm already sorry that I'm not going into any details. Uh, but um, <laughs> the idea was not to present, I don't know, the implementation, how we do it, but rather um, uh, a conceptual idea, that's why I call it the conceptual model. So um, I picked these five concepts that I think uh, would uh, be good building blocks for such a model. Uh, so we all know that there should be data or metadata, whatever context, um, and we want to have PIDs for that, of course. So we have the, the PID building block there. We also know we want to have the core metadata outliving our data so that if for some reason, our data is not there any, anymore for, I don't know, legal privacy reasons or anything else. Um, we still want to be able to resolve this identifier and know what was actually there in the past in, a, in, a, in some sense. Um, yeah, uh, maybe a note to that. So uh, and when I say PID, I also may mean, of course, a globally unique resolvable identifier. Um, yeah, so we also need to have a place for our data somehow. Um, even though it might not live forever uh, or exist forever, it should be live as long as we can somehow sustain it, right? So that's why I call it long living data, not just data. And um, then there are the more complicated parts. So we have this uh, machine accessibility, machine readability, which regarding types and profiles and uh, ideas that, that belong in this category. And we have the category of uh, operations. Um, so machines can actually act on, on the PIDs in a very specified uh, manner. So this also goes in the direction of maybe at some point reproducibility. Um, yeah. So, and these are the concepts that I picked. So probably one could do it uh, very different, but I think it makes up a very uh, general framework. So what do we actually need? So obviously we need some uh, storage for the data. Um, I think that is kind of obvious. Data have, has to, to live somewhere. We need a storage for our core metadata that has to live longer than that. And we have the PIDs. PIDs are persistent, so they should live forever whatever that means. And we have the storage for types and semantics and the storage or a place for operations. Somehow they have to be defined, right? A machine uh, needs to know where they are, what they are, how to execute something. Yeah. Um, and if we say, okay, this, these systems are maybe very general. So we have a general PID system, let's say the handle system or anything else. There are, I don't know, arcs, GOIs, which are part of the handle system, but yeah. Um, so um, these systems will not interact with each other. So we need something in between and we need, of course, clients. So people can actually use it. So, and these um, things in between will then somehow, of course, connect these uh, storage places um, in, in the way that we say, okay, this is our fair deal concept. But of course, we also don't want our clients to just like um, 
um, reinvent the wheel every time. So we want to, uh, them to be able to reuse these these definitions. So we would probably have some library definitions uh, that uh, the clients can reuse, or even services that do these for the clients um, and on a more higher level. Validation is a good example. Um, so validation um, requires, of course, the PID system, almost every action on Fairly Old somehow requires the PID system, and of course, the semantics and the types that we use to, to make it uh, interesting for machines rather than for humans in, in the first place. So, uh, and now I'm going to uh, show in a very rough manner how we adapted uh, this, this, this idea. So for the storage, we just say, okay, um, storage is really diverse, right? So, um, and we know, don't know what comes in the future and we don't know how to support uh, specifically everything that we already have. So I will call that legacy. So we say, okay, uh, clients will directly interact with that. So um, just check. Yeah, I can use the pointer. So the clients can directly access um, the storage systems. So there's no... Uh, oops. Okay, the mouse is probably okay. So, um, yeah. So we want to support all data that already exists somehow, and we want maybe also be flexible with future storage systems, whatever will come there. Okay. The interesting part is now that core metadata it should live longer than the um, uh, storage systems and possibly as long as the PIDs. So what we did is. Um, as it's uh, recommended in the RDA uh, kernel information profile output. Um, we simply use the, the handle system to store in a key value manner um, the core metadata within the PID system. So as long as the PID exists, the core metadata will also exist. We then reuse the EPIC data type registry uh, from the GWDG and um, for operations, while well, this is still work in progress, uh, I will come back to that. And as an intermediate um, tooling, let's say, we have a service called the Type PID Maker. So um, the advantage of having just a service, not a library or anything else, are uh, manifold. So, for example, we have uh, technical advantages that we can cache. PIDs and information a lot. So this is really helpful for validation, for example, because the validation of a PID will need um, a lot of uh, PIDs to be resolved. And if we cache this information, this happens mostly immediately. And uh, if we don't, wouldn't cache this, this could take seconds. And depending on your discipline, if you need really to validate and resolve a lot of stuff, uh, a few seconds are a lot. So this sums up quickly. Um, you can, we also have some organizational advantages. So we can have access control. Uh, in the type case of the type PID maker, we have a uh, key cloak um, support. So you can um, allow researchers to log in with their um, institutional credentials, for example, if you're able to, to connect it. Um, and we can also enforce validation. So these high-level interfaces are basically like the, the CRUD interfaces, like create, update, resolve, no delete. So, um, and if we create a PID, we will enforce validation. So only if the validation of the PID or the information you want to register, the core metadata, if the validation is successful, the PID will create it. If it's not successful, it won't. So this is some kind of uh, quality insurance uh, at this point. Um, yeah, and of course, as I said before, the, the connection between the services is being done within this service. So the client doesn't have to care how to communicate with this uh, storage system and that storage system. And to, to realize this task instead, it's implemented in, in one uh, service. And we can also integrate into local services and lab tooling, as I will show on the next slide. So um, this is the, the detail, the type PID maker in detail. And as you can see, there are the two green um, connections at the top. So we have connection to the data type registry. So that's DTR. 
and the connection uh, to handle.net, which uh, where the PIDs and the core metadata resist. It's hard to control the mouse here. Okay. Um, and these are the things that probably, uh, if you would agree on, on such a system, uh, everyone would share somehow, right? So we have the, the common semantics and we have uh, uh, the, uh, the same resolver. So we, all, we know how to resolve a PID if we see it. So. But uh, the blue ones are actually maybe possibly something local. So you can support um, um, local tooling within your lab. So for example, three minutes left. Okay, sorry. Okay, I will make fast. Um, so it will remember the PIDs that you created or modified and uh, you will have some kind of log on that. You will be able to search via Elasticsearch you will be able to connect to other tools via this AMQP, AMQP protocol to send messages to register your uh, your publications at the library or something like that. So this is the idea. We have a simple REST API for the client and DOIP is planned for the, um, for the uh, work in progress operations idea that um, a colleague is working on. Okay, so how do we uh, work with that? So we have a Docker Compose setup that we call the FairDO Lab that has some pre-built um, um, tooling around it and the dependencies like, or optional dependencies like the Elasticsearch. So you will have some search index by, defa uh, by default. You will have a sandbox PID, so you can experiment by default if you don't have a PID prefix set. But uh, on the right, you can also see that we have some is the mouse, uh, that we have some services that do uh, not really use or, or do not use the type PID maker. So they just read information, they don't write information. Um, but and, and for them, it's perfectly fine uh, to do it like this uh, and not depend on this service in, in the middle. If you really want to try it out, uh, maybe this is more, more feasible and, and faster and easier to use. The, we have this demo server. And if you go there, you will have some, some applications you can click on and everything uh, should hopefully work and will be reset uh, once a day. So it's really just uh, for testing. But to, cam to come back to our actual model. Um, so I want to note that the demo server uses this model. It uses the FADIO lab in the background but you won't see it if you visit the website. So the point I want to make is that the fabric will in the end be mostly invisible to the user. And that's our goal, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have some immediate questions? I'm also looking. Okay, can you hear me? That was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, have you discussed sort of socializing it within the um, your respective NFDI consortia? Have you who who is the stakeholder for for this intended to be researchers? Mm -hmm. um, so we have people in our group uh, involved in some of the NFDIs. Uh, I think it's NFDI Matwerk and NFDI for Ing. Um, I know that hey, they have been using it. I'm not sure about the exact extent to, to what uh, it's used right now. I'm not sure if we have more in information on that from, from Rainer. But, but the next steps are that this is a pilot that will be rolled out and hopefully integrated within um, yeah, so, communities. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, well, the, the adaption is not on, on my personal side, so I'm, I'm not sure how, how people will decide on that. Uh, we will continue, of course, to to develop this. You can see that the operations concept is still um, still an open question. And um, yeah, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Um, just one comment to that: NFDI is the German National Research Data Infrastructure, which is currently built up for the next ten years, um, and has uh, some funding. And these concepts, of course, are adopted within the NFDI in the various consortia. Uh, there is yeah. a question in the uh, yeah. in the notes. In Don't forget to pick up on that, Rainer. 
Uh, yeah, Jakob König from Infineon Austria. Thank you very much for this talk. I was wondering if you could put the the KIT data manager in context of the Nomad repository and their work on data management systems within the NFDI. Okay. Uh, okay. So the name data manager, uh, I think it quite evolved. Uh, the, the name has been there before I started. So this is kind of the the overarching name for for a lot of tooling that we do. It's not only uh, including the fair digital object concept. I think. Um, I don't know the Nomad repository. Sorry. Um, Here's the idea: is since this is an overarching concept, it can link to any repositories to any content of the repositories. Ah, okay. To to that point, I can maybe uh, say something. So we have this uh, choose any storage system in, in that point, right? So the idea is that the core metadata should describe how to, to access the object in the background. And the idea is also that by the, or it's recommended not to point to the landing page, but directly to the data if possible. Um, yeah. I have a question there. Yeah. Like, normally it's not just the repository. It's yeah. Really yes. Okay. Let's thank Andreas again. Thank you very much. Rainer, can and, you hear me? And we would like to continue with Cha. And I'm very, very happy that we have Cha here from, I hope I pronounced it correctly, <laughs> um, um, from the uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences. And she will give us an insight about CSTR tools for industry digital objects. Just take the next slide. Yeah. That's not work. Okay. Oh, there's a little bit hair for me. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very appreciated to have this opportunity to give my presentation here. And several years ago, I um, gave the uh, presentation in this state fabric uh, interesting group here. Uh, the topic is about the IoT industry. At that time, the FDO is just uh, raised from this uh, working group, and I'm focusing on the PID system. But I'm very uh, delighted uh, that to share the use case today that we adopted the FDO in the industrial uh, internet. So uh, first, I would like to say that um, uh, the industrial and the science, they are a little bit uh, different about the data sharing, uh, especially the data policy. Uh, for the science, uh, especially for the researchers, they would like to the research data to be shared more and more, the better the uh, transparency. But for the industrial, um, because the data is uh, sensitive to the commercial, so uh, it will be limited sharing. Uh, except for the data set, uh, for the um, the the, the uh, will share the data uh, with the uh, supply chain only. So um, I would like to say that uh, at the basis of the technology uh, development in our science, we can give or uh, give the industry mm -hmm. some uh, technical support. And uh, uh, I'm from the uh, thing I see. So the PID technology is the uh, original technology in our institutions here. So we have done something in the industrial area that I, I would like to share. But uh, I want to say that the data fabric is uh, very important, especially the fair uh, digital object, uh, because that um, in the industry, we, we could not see that the data citation, this, uh, this uh, application, especially in the science, but in the industry, we could see the other application scenarios here. So um, in China, uh, the PIDs is the co-component of the industry of the internet. And they realized that the central nervous systems, so, um, what uh, what we are doing is uh, in the central, this is the public service. Now, uh, this is because 
um, for the industrials, the researchers, they do not know how to um, how to interworking with the PID systems. They do not know uh, some com components of the PID system, but they do really have the requirements for the using the DOs and using the uh, PID systems. But for the industrial, the scenarios is very complex uh, compared to our uh, science uh, industrials. Uh, so uh, the public service that we are doing is supported by the national uh, government project. And uh, I would like to see that there are many parts, especially the seven parts, seven parts of the uh, basic service here. Uh, I would like to highlight uh, two parts. The first is a knowledge graph service and second is the meta uh, master data model. In the master data model, we build some um, industrial data uh, uh, date uh, fabrics here and the date fair uh, digital ob objects. And we also have uh, delivered our protocols uh, such as the DOIP that is using as the support uh, component to the industrial uh, scenarios. So uh, after, uh, I would like to share two uh, tools here. The first is the industrial digital object created tools. And there are two components here. Oh, well. Uh, the first one is um, uh, we uh, do some common data templates, uh, which is um, in the specific uh, industrial um, scenarios. It's a different varies from the scenarios. A second one, we do some uh, domain data templates. This two software, uh, no, two tools is based on, we have building the data models for the industrial. And then we will do the uh, data harvest, uh, data association and uh, visualization workflows. And finally, the industrial access. Uh, in the last step, it's a little bit um, the same to the uh, science in, uh, science uh, area because they would like to share this data only in the limited area with their supply chain partnerships. Then based on this component, we uh, give some uh, technology support to the industrial data traceability uh, applications. And the second two is about the, the uh, PIDs, which is one component for the FDOs here, but this PIDs is almost different from the PIDs that we talked about in the science. Um, for the research data, the PIDs is mainly for the traceability, for the citations, and for the broad broadcasting of our outputs here. But for the industrials, the PIDs here is the mapping tools. Um, in China, the, uh, we do use the industrial internet uh, PIDs. This is one kind of the industrial PIDs. And we also adopted the handle system, the SSTR system, the GS1 system, the EPC global system, and whatever. So this PID systems is not used in uh, the uh, human readable. It's almost the machine readable PIDs here. But the PID is not a, the topic uh, today. I just want to show that uh, based on the uh, concept of the uh, digital objects, we use in the PID making tools to transfer the different PIDs to connect the different DOs in different industrial areas, especially in the supply chain. In the supply chain is, um, how to say, it's a more open ecosystem compared to the uh, inside the company, the industrial, the manufacturing. So uh, with these two uh, tools here, uh, we just make, um, actually we have um, up to 24 <laughs> scenarios here, but I would like to just show uh, one uh, use cases of the industrial internet is very interesting here. It is called the personalized customization of the closest layer. So uh, for this scenario, uh, the, uh, the uh, holding uh, company is the leading company of the industrial internet in this uh, scenario. Areas. So um, uh, this picture shows that they have um, a manufacturing uh, tools and uh, computing control systems. And on the left side, you can see which each um, each suit they have the uh, raw materials. And this this raw materials they have their own uh, suppliers. They use their own PIDs. And when they are entered this manufacturing, they will be tagged into a PID transfer tools here and to connect with the manufacturing process. And 
uh, you can see the second page. The second page is that see there is a solving hanging thread here. And for the, each suit, they will have their uh, buttons and their materials uh, for the um, workers there. They just scanned the barcode and they will, there will be the information that is based on the industrial DOs showing on the uh, screen of the uh, workers there. They do not just want to see uh, the buttons, uh, the colors, the size by themselves, by human. And the computers will talk to them about Oh, this button should go to the second place of this, just for example. So that is very interesting uh, in the uh, FDO adopted as the uh, combined with the PID tools in the industrial internet. So uh, using these uh, uh, scenarios, uh, the saved cost and they have the fast, um, uh, fast uh, efficiency and the high efficiency in the uh, suit uh, processing. And I think this company is an uh, international company. And uh, this is just one part of their uh, manufacturing uh, in the processing that they use the FTOs and the PID systems here. So um, the this project, this is uh, just one case of uh, the project uh, which is supported by the uh, Ministry of Industrial and Information Technology uh, for the uh, uh, five year, uh, for the uh, four years here. And uh, the funding is, is about the $30 million. And uh, the thing I see is the leading party cooperated with the China AII and the four companies. Uh, there are several outputs, um, 14 industrial domain uh, knowledge graphs, and the 23 specific applications and six public services here. Um, I'm very um, uh, delighted that um, several years ago, we talked about the, the DOIPs, the FDOs, the data fabricators, um, maybe I think in the Germany, the Berlin here, but at that time we don't have the use cases. But several years after, in China, the PIDs is high level, not only in the science area, but also in the industrial area. The PIDs, the data fabric, especially the data management, they do not care about the, the um, how to see the scenarios. They are just the basic support for different areas here. So uh, what I would like to see is that um, as the scientists on the uh, research data, especially the uh, supporters of the in infra infrastructures, uh, we do not only have the ability to support the research data, but uh, we could see that our ability and technology support output to the industrial, that is very interesting. So um, the last two pages, I would like to, uh, I would like to introduce the uh, CSTR. It is the full name is Common Science and Technology Resource. It is um, based on the uh, Chinese uh, national uh, standards here. And uh, I have already uh, presented the list uh, uh, parallel in several uh, meetings here. And uh, the, in the, um, Chinese uh, AII, the industrial internet, the DOIP and DO, and the outputs of the, especially the fair digital out outputs, it's um, raised and it's talked about in the scientists for the uh, industrial internet. And the CITR is here, uh, not only for the use as the PIDs, but for the technology, especially the decentralized uh, decentralized technology at architecture for the support of this uh, industrial internet. And the last page I would like to share, uh, there are some um, opportunities for us to get a uh, tight uh, cooperation is about the, uh, we have several, um, we have several projects uh, in the uh, supported by the CAS, especially for the PiFi, and uh, we would like to do some uh, co collaborated um, research with uh, international international uh, groups uh, and uh, welcome all the experts from uh, different countries to come to China and we can do some um, previous uh, research for the not only the PIDs but also on uh, the research data and open science. So uh, that is the end of my speech here. And if you are uh, want to uh, connect with me and you can find me in the uh, HUA and uh, that is uh, my uh, presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much.
before we ask uh, for questions and remarks, um, we are here in a hybrid session. So we have the communication here in the room, we have our presentations, we have our notes. Also, some questions appear in the notes. And uh, I would like to ask all the speakers to also look into the notes and answer the questions afterwards in the notes. Then we have our online our uh, online participants with the chat and so on. So, and I really, really, I'm sorry if we are not able to observe everybody at this, with the same attention. Um, and of course, um, uh, this is something our Zoom meet, uh, our Zoom participants can't just open, they are not able to just open their microphone and to speak, are they? They just raise their okay. So if you raise, uh, if you're online and raising your hands, you will get microphone access. Are there any questions to Cha? Hi, thank you for the very nice presentation. Could you please identify yourself? Uh, yes. Before? Danke. Yes. Um, John Grabio, um, of um, the. Vocabulary and Special Services Interest Group. Um, I uh, wondered about your use of CSTR in particular, and the. Um, it, it, I'm sorry, I hadn't heard your earlier presentations about it, but um, it seems that it is a very sophisticated classification resource, and is it one that is uh, commonly available on the web and can other people use it as well? Can we put it on other repositories? Yeah, thank you for your questions. And uh, uh, I like these questions very much because this is uh, give me the opportunity to introduce the CSDR. And the CSDR uh, is a one of the PIDs for the open science. And uh, there are several, you can see uh, the number scan and there are two digitals besides the tab resource code. So the SSTR is, um, the, the national standards is published in 2016 and the platform is established in 2018. And right now the SSTR is uh, one of the uh, protocols supported by the IETF IANA, the same with the DOI. And especially the SSTR is used by the especially the uh, national data centers in China and the CAS data centers in China and the dissertations, repositories, science data banks. And uh, they are widely, not widely used, but I think um, they are growing. Yeah, they are growing. So the CSTR is uh, decentralized. Uh, in this level, it's uh, sometimes the same to the handle systems. And because for the open science, the researchers, especially the data repositories, they would like to make their own data policies. Hydracy management and the traceability and the number of schemas for different disciplines, they want to make it by themselves. And that's why the CSTR, we do not um, have the uh, many uh, metadata here, we just have our core metadata, but for the GEO and the uh, chemistry, they have their own uh, metadata in their own CSTR subnode here. So the CSTR is uh, used as one of the PIDs. Um, because, uh, why I uh, make a short instruction is because the CSTR, I, I, I think this is uh, just one component to the uh, digital uh, uh, object. I think that the digital object, uh, the use of the digital object based on the PID systems is more valuable to the scenarios, to the industrials. And we can get some uh, insights, feedback from the um, industrial. I think they will steal our ideas to promote how we can deliver the research data here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's thank Cha again. Um, I find it especially exciting to see how uh, these concepts are also penetrating industry. And this is really great. So now uh, I would like to welcome Siri and Marius to talk about, oh, do I need to read the whole topic? Yeah. Lessons learned from implementing FTOs in the co-science research data management platform. 
a view beyond FTOs, beyond singular files. And Marius, Siri, Sir. Yes, Rainer. thank you very much for that short introduction. And you almost had all the half of the talk with, uh, with the title. So I'll, uh, um, so very uh, um, happy that we can be here to um, present our work and to present our view on, on FDOs um, from a perspective um, that uh, where we didn't or we were not involved in any of the specification process or we didn't come up with FDOs and many people who are implementing or have implemented FDOs so far were part of the group who initially thought about FDOs and we were not. So we had a very fresh mind on that and just have had a look on that. And um, so the first thing I would like to introduce is our platform that we're using to implement FDOs and which is COSIGN, which is a collaborative scientific integration environment. And as the name says, it's an integrated environment. So maybe a bit different to what we've seen in the first talk, instead of having individual tools that work with, um, um, yeah, work with existing uh, other applications, we try to integrate it into one tool and uh, try to provide a more streamlined way of, of, of connecting these things. And this starts with a login process. You can create scientific projects. You can add metadata. You can add uh, application profiles for um, um, research-specific uh, or discipline-specific information. And then we have the actual data. That's the, the resources part where the, the, yeah, the data is actually stored. But um, again, they are we rely on um, the uh, yeah rely on external systems so on on high performance storage systems industry grade so we don't reinvent the wheel and try to store stuff on our local file system but use S3 or um, GitLab or Git systems that are specialized in storing certain kinds of data and we just integrate them into the process and finally as uh, good practice suggests, we're also trying to archive and hold the information as long as possible. And um, so don't get distracted by the red thing that's supposed to be to appear later. I'll tell you when. <laughs> um, so one thing we when we started with is we said, okay, we want to identify everything that we create with a PID. So no matter where the uh, res where the projects are coming from, we give them a PID as an as a as a record. And the second thing is, uh, if there is a resource um, uh, that's on, on GitLab or in an arbitrary S3 system or wherever we, we find them, we also assign them a PID to make them uh, identifiable and, and findable. And then uh, we add some administrative metadata, like who created it and who has access to it and what it's about, maybe an abstract, a title, um, uh, that, that, that kind of stuff. And then we have some resource type specific set of operations. So of course, if you have an S3 bucket, it's different from a GitLab repository because they're just different kinds of operations you can make on the, um, on, the uh, uh, yeah, on the data. And in the middle, we do have some very rich metadata and linked data. So that's all linked data. It's validated to a certain degree because we have these application profiles, but we really focus on um, having as much metadata as possible. So this uh, is not just the administrative part, but really the scientific uh, part that's interesting for, for the users to, to find their data again. And what we come up with and said, okay, what, we, what do we want to have? Actually, we want to have one digital object per project and then probably also one digital object per resource. Um, and that gives us a worst case M to N relationship between these digital objects because we uh, have one project that may contain multiple resources. And if you think about reuse, then a resource might come up in a different project. So this is a complex, complex mapping. And now, the uh, red part appears. So we have two things which we want to which we want to look at is uh, one thing: how do we create this um, uh, this uh, yeah this fair do for one resource, which is a bit more complex than just identifying a single binary file. And uh, on the other hand, how do we navigate between these two different kinds of fair dos in in our platform? And what we've initially looked at is the uh, two different fair digital object implementation concepts. And we found two of them which were very appealing. Um, we have also seen the this uh, PID based or, or handle PID based kernel information profile plus kernel information record one in the previous talk, um, which is defined widely technology independent. It is an RDA recommendation that's been continuously enhanced. 
And we have some independent implementations from a couple of friends who we do know uh, from KIT, for example, who already tried that out, which is nice. And then we have the fair data point, which is based on W3 standards, um, DCAT, linked data platform on top of that fair data point, um, uh, and DCAT again, sorry for that. Um, uh, and that, that's why based on W3C standards, it is very much work in progress. There exists a very nice proof of concept implementation for a federation. So how to federate these kind of things. And um, also very interesting, and especially it's based on semantic technologies, which kind of is nice because we're having all our metadata in semantic anyway. So the question is, why not both? Uh, yeah, let's link this kernel information record to the fair data point, and if that would work, that would be very nice and a great success. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and so we started with the fair data point and then uh, started implementing the the PID part or the kernel information part, and that's where Ziri is going to take over and explain a little bit what her experiences were. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Ziri, and I'm a software developer for Cosign. And I followed the left approach, um, which uh, includes uh, creating a PID kernel information profile and a kernel information record. So how did I do that? Um, so I tried to uh, create a very um, simple graphic to understand um, what I do in the background. So on the right side, we see our research data platform, Cosign. And um, so I first tried to, um, because um, when we're creating a resource, every time also a PID um, will be created. And um, yeah, so that's the first step. And um, while we're creating a PID, um, I also add a PID record with certain uh, types that I got from the RDA recommendation. And uh, these kind of types are pointing to the actual data. So for example, the file. And um, yeah, the file, of course, lies in the resource. Um, yeah, so this is what I did there. Um, so um, above, you can see the um, test PID um, in the search file. And I tried to, um, as I said, um, add a PID information record. On the left side, we see the types that I choose. And on the right side, uh, we see the values that I put in there. And um, yeah, this was my first test. And um, it's also a very, um, it was my first try. And um, I had much knowledge uh, about the um, approach of the creating a fair digit object. So I just tried to do anything <laughs> to get a result. So, um, as I said, what I just did in the background in Cosign was um, whenever I recreate a PID for a resource, we just add a PID record and I just defined fixed types in the code and just said, okay, um, for this kind of type, I request this certain value and put it then in there. And then um, I call the uh, handler service and say, okay, hey, this is a PID record, uh, stick to that, to the PID. And that's what happened in the first try. So. Um, now I'll give you a look. Uh, <laughs> so on the right side, you can see the RDA recommendation of the defined um, types that you need to have for the PID record or for the kernel information profile. And on the left side was my first approach. And um, yeah, if we take a look on that now, you can see maybe the difference. <laughs> I did not um, choose uh, every um, type of the RDA recommendation because um, for cosine, it was, for example, very difficult to um, have the type uh, of the um, ETEC um, checksum because we are not having that in cosine and also version version control. This is also something that we are not um, implemented in cosine currently. So that's why I just choose um, sometimes that I worked for cosine and just to get one result and to see at the end if that works for a certain PID in cosine. And it did work in a test environment. So, and now um, I'm currently working on implementing it um, to the live system because the um, first thing that I did was just a test in a test environment. And now I, uh, yeah, talk um, with colleagues from the Helmholtz Institute too and the people from KIT to get a very fixed, um, yeah, PID record or 
kernel information profile. So this is what I did the last couple of weeks. I just um, went through the table and um, just checked what works for cosine, what can I use as a type and what can I put uh, as value in there. And as you can see there, um, I got some red marks and um, I already decided, okay, this is not working for cosine. And um, there are also some check marks where I can easily see, okay, this is working for cosine. This is something that I already have. And yeah, currently I think there are one, two, three, four, five types that I need to, um, yeah, need to, uh, how to say that, um, can't, that I can't use right now for cosine because it's not working. Yeah. Um, yes, we're also having a documentation where we just um, went through every type from the RDA recommendation and um, checked, is it working for cosine? What's the meaning for us for the type? And that you can see on the uh, right side. Yes, so um, this is a question <laughs> that I um, have in my mind right now because um, we can see that um, to create a fetish object in cosine right now is possible. I showed it in the test and it's working. Um, but at the end, I need to know what I did there. Um, how to check or how can I check if the implementation is correct? And I hope we can take this question in the discussion and maybe we'll get an answer or maybe not. <laughs> yes. And yeah, the next topic, uh, Marcus will talk about it. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to start with the next question. Uh, so I already said we, we have the challenge that apart from, from so in Kosan, we, we not only link a single binary file, but a whole resource. I'll try to speed up. Um, and uh, then first we thought, okay, is it even possible? Because so far, most of the examples we've seen actually just use federal objects to identify a single bit sequence. And um, but actually, it, when you look at the specification or at the, at the um, uh, description, it says it's a unit of data in one place and it's actionable. So that doesn't really say it's a single file and the object itself can be, yeah, whatever you want. Um, so our inter interpretation of that is it's not a, uh, it, for first, it's not a unit of non-changeable data. So it might be changed over time, which is actually quite interesting. Um, and especially for us, since we're also kind of a collaboration platform, um, we we endorse people to change their stuff. Um, so we have to update the PID essentially uh, if it changes. Um, then uh, operations are probably more than just a link. Um, so you probably want to have more than just hey that that's where the data is and try HTTP GET. Um, so if it's a Git repository, you might have much more information on there. Um, then in our case, the this kind of information record is entirely disconnected from our actual project or from our actual um, object or, or resource. So we have to synchronize that. And yeah, as I said, we have, we have many, many different operations uh, for the resources. And why is that? That is because we're not looking at the singular file. So we're essentially looking at the cloud. Um, but uh, the cloud is more than that. So we, we might look at maps services, which have tons of individual pictures um, that have a relation to each other. We have uh, S3 or object store buckets. We have Sparkle endpoints for knowledge graphs. We have electronic lab notebooks. Uh, we have Git or source code repositories. And um, uh, so, yeah, that boils really down. How do, how do we describe these kind of more complex um, fetishal objects and um, how do they work? And uh, we've seen that in the previous talk, I guess we have to talk about interfaces and operations um, and think about how they can uh, be represented nicely in the fetish objects. And with that question or task or uh, invitation for discussion, I can close our talk and thank you for your attention and I hope we stay more or less in time. Thank you very much, Siri and Marius. Um, just one short remark, especially to Donny Christians. What are we doing here? We bring together VR communication and a coordination platform, those who are really trying to implement that, and we are explaining that. And this is what this group, our interest group, is about. 
Do we have questions before we go to uh, specific questions to Marius and Siri before we go to the general discussion? I'm just looking also at the chat. Oh, of course. Uh, so you have shown that you can implement the kernel information profile. What new functionality do you hope to get out of this? What What's the goal or the benefit of going through this work? I, I think you've shown that you are able to do it, but you need to have something available to you that isn't now within Cosign. You need some new uh, ability functionality. Uh, maybe it's just to say that the data is fair, um, but... <laughs> Of course, that, that's but the, it should have a greater benefit. That, that's than, the main motivation. Um, so um, so the, the general vision of Cosine is a bit to provide a fair layer so that you can hook up an arbitrary resource in there and say, okay, now whatever it is, afterwards it is fair. Um, and that's, of course, the, the claim that we make for our researchers. And we offer that system to 42 universities in the federal state of Northern Westphalia. So it's quite a big of bunch of people um, we want to make happy with that system. That's the one thing. And the other thing is what Rainer already introduced. We have this German national research data infrastructure, which is currently being built up. And we see Cosign as one of the parts in there. So we also want to be able to build a data federation to a certain degree. And that's what we hope to solve with the fair digital object so that every repository or every member or every whatever you want to call it implements the FedEOs. And then we can... Uh, share data or exchange data or exchange information uh, in between these different implementations. And that's why this kind of standard or, or compliance or validation that our implementation is correct, however you want to call it, is so important to us that we don't build fair digital object islands, every one of them claiming, yeah, I stuck to the recommendation. <laughs> but we need to be really sure that that the, the actual actionability and the, the, the yeah, the um, transferability and, and exchangeability of the data is actually given. The interoperability. And interoperability, yeah. Yeah. And verified interoperability, to so to say, right? So. Yeah. Uh, Barbara Magania from Google Foundation. Um, what you present here is really interesting, and um, I'm doing for Google Foundation something similar with nano publications. We have identified, we have metadata about all these resources. So I'm very interested in to, uh, to, to look into this uh, approach. And I wanted to ask if cosine is something that I can also access, or is that just for the universities that you sent? Or is it, is it open? Uh, can we collaborate? Because I, that's the same thing. I really want to see how this interoperates. So uh, yeah, you can access it. It's under co you can find all information on the cosign.de. So there's uh, all the all, all the stuff. You can log in with an Orchid account. Um, the only thing that you cannot do if you're not part of a of the one of the participating universities is request storage space, because mm -hmm. essentially that's where the the costs begin. So if you want to store petabytes of data with us, that's something where you have to have a cooperation partner. Um, but the let's say the metadata part is open for everyone, so you can just start create a project and and create a PID within the project, and then just check what what happens. And yeah, I'm more interested on the developer. Uh, and of course, side. the development so part is it's all open source, so you can I, uh, and uh, have interact a that. with you. <laughs> That's uh, the main. Yeah. If possible. So, and mm -hmm. then of course we can also have a have an exchange on that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Marius and Siri, again. And then we come to the general discussion. Well, according to the schedule, maybe we have about 20 minutes for general uh, questions or even some several questions about the three presentations are also welcome. Any questions, suggestions, or some com comments? Ah, Maggie online has spoken. Okay. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, point out that there are a number of questions in the notes document. Uh, I don't know if some of those could be picked up to start the discussion.
Maggie, could you please read the questions in the note do notes document? I think it is easier if you share the screen with that. And uh, apologies, I'm having a little bit of a technical issue at the moment. Maggie, you are able to share your screen. As I said, I'm having a technical issue at the moment. Apologies. Oh. Mm -hmm. Ooh, it works. Um, the the starting from um, the final comment about in the last presentation about the fair creating a fair digital object for a group of fair digital objects. Um, it it is seemed to be the case in the efforts I've made to create these things that will be interoperable from everyone from the get-go that the when you cast any framework into an implementation the details of that implementation have to be defined all the way down so in the case of the example of a fair digital object that has other fair digital objects in it we know there are a lot of proposals out there to group things and if your top level fair digital object is that group, there's really no conflict. And uh, so it then becomes a question of how do you constrain the choices or list the choices that are available to you for detailing on all the way down so everyone knows how to interpret it all the way down. Um, and I see you nodding a lot. Should I pass you the microphone? To to a certain degree, that's exactly our the, the problem that we have with the recommendations, right? Because there were recommendations that said, yeah, do it like this, but they're technology independent. So we, we're not telling you how, how to implement it in a certain protocol, and we're not telling you how to how to do it with today's technology. That's a, a, a that's also a, a discussion I regularly have with Rhino. Of course, we have to define our concept technology independent because technologies are gonna change. They're definitely gonna catch us. Um, but on the other hand, uh, as as of today, I need to to tell uh, a software developer like Siri at a certain point, hey, that's the specification. That's the your server should do this, and it has to do this. And if if it, the HTTP request like that comes in, it has to reply like that. And that that's the the let's say the nice thing about the the link data point or link data platform, which is in W three three W three C standard. So it has a lot all these things where you just can tick some boxes. And of course, at some point, if they say, well, this HTTP model is no longer valid, then we're screwed. We have to, to reinvent. Yeah. Uh, and then it's good if we have that concept and, and, and agree again. Uh, but I think to a certain degree, we now need to produce both in order to, to really achieve this kind of interoperability. And um, uh, that, that's what I also say. We, we have to make sure that we're not inventing fair digital object islands. Uh, at least make them federal object continents or something. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, my name is Heike Görtig. I'm from the Helmholtz Center in Berlin. And I have a question how, uh, I mean, we have a data repository and um, so we have to, we have our obligations to to be to be harvested, let's say by open air, be to find, and we have our API, and so on. So, um, how how would you think we would integrate then in this uh, in 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 this landscape? Is there somebody going to um, with an other infrastructure uh, build up to to look at our repository um, as well? And yeah. And I mean, it means somehow extra extra work for us, but I think it it, it really looks interesting. So so um to 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 get the data from from our repository and and know the operations to have it then in in a workflow later on. So is there somehow a infrastructure already set up for this where we can let's say and get some instructions what to do about this? Just full. 
<laughs> does, does anybody wants to answer this question? If, if not, I have a couple of answers to that, of course. Um, currently, there are a couple of approaches. One, one approach is the DOIP approach, which uses the uh, digital object DOIP, Digital Object Interface Protocol, um, which will be it can be integrated in a certain kind of a repository. Since you are already have a live repository running, uh, and there are many out there, maybe not all of them want to change their repositories. But this is definitely an option for new repositories, which might be really interesting to have uh, a certain kind of interoperability on a high level. Secondly, there's a different approach, which is independent of the repository itself. So you define a fair digital object, like what Andreas did, on top of it, not on top of the repository, you just have a data source. And you shape this link to the data for, for, uh, the, of this data resource in, in a kind of a fair digital object on top of it. Currently, we are doing that with a certain kind of data uh, of Zenodo, which can be just mapped to a fair digital object. So you have it outside of your repository. But it, of course, it's additional. Work. Other question, uh, answers to that? Do you want to answer directly? So just, just as a just as very short uh, addition. So uh, what we did was, for example, for Zenodo, um, looking um, to get some some PIDs from there and then demonstrate that we can, um, well, extract metadata from there and build FADOs on that. It's, of course, limited on the information that is available. That will always be the case. I would say that, uh, well, we have to live with, with uh, what we have <laughs> and take it. Um, um, yeah, probably uh, maybe newer or at least maintained repositories can adjust them over time. So I think it's a process that will take time. Um, but it's, it, I would say it's possible to have some kind of, instead of changing your repository, have some service on top that takes the data that you already have and put register such PIDs on top. Maybe a follow-up question on that. I mean, uh, FTO. Uh, okay, I'm Rolf Kral. I'm also with Helmut Zentrum Berlin. Uh, so, and I'm operating that repository that I was with. <laughs> um, so, if FDOs are def defined uh, PID uh, data, metadata, and machine actionable operations on them. And the I I think the the main question is what are these operations, and that is a you had said that is work in progress for you, and and I didn't see many say uh, comments on that. I mean the obvious operation that you can do is retrieval of the data. That is of course an easy thing, but at the moment I don't see much on top of that. Yeah, so I also missed my uh, to identify myself. So for the online listeners, I'm not sure. Yeah, can they can see me? So I'm the presenter of the first presentation, um, Andreas Pfeil from from KIT. Um So the same question was also in in the in the chat. So I have to repeat this somehow. So uh, you're right. So um, the the question is how we can actually benefit from that. So uh, our colleague uh, Nicolas. Um, is working in the field of AI data. So he's uh, exactly evaluating that, how can he actually benefit from that and how would operations have to work to do so? Um, that's why I say it's work in progress because I can't really tell you that much about it. Um, there is often the idea that uh, something uh, is executable somehow on the server and you get the result from this uh, digital object be it something like uh, image uh, rotation, something simple or getting the data. But of course, uh, we somehow want to get beyond that probably. But... Oh. 
So um, yeah, Marius Blitz again, one of the presenters, and we also brought this topic up with the operations. And I, so I see it especially when you when you go beyond a describing a singular file entity. So we had we have one example uh, where the data is a is is a Google Maps overlay or OpenStreetMaps overlay, and then you do not only have like retrieve me the data, but you have different uh, zoom levels of the data. And uh, there may be, um, you may want to request from, from a vector graphic, a certain image rendering. And to me, these are all operations that one could define on top of this data set. And especially when it gets to geospatial or this kind of tiled map data, which you can also see in computer tomography or other, could be three-dimensional and, and stuff like that. Um, I see a lot more operations that you could define just to, retrieve the data and then if i go one step further in the, in the sense of cosine we do not only have fixed data sets but we have evolving data so it's a data set that's being worked on currently so there may be operations to replace things to update to query certain certain parts of the data so we have with a lot of other uh so i can see a lot of other operations even if i think about uh, uh, git repositories being a fair do uh, I, I could access versions, hundreds of versions, um, uh, um, branches, uh, um, issues. Uh, so the data set is getting much more complex than just saying it's just five files and this is the link and HTTP GET or, or DOIP uh, retrieve is going to help you there. So that's why I see operations is so important and the different types are so important uh, to describe. <laughs> Maybe we, maybe we I just had a follow follow up question to my to my question. So we have this data repository, but we can't do this this federated thing. Um, so if we would implement now and having our interface that we could provide a digital, uh, a fair digital object in in this way you describe, who is actually interested to get this? Yeah, I, I would like to uh, make an additional uh, point is that um, I think that uh, it is different from the uh, PIDs. We could not just use the PIDs to help the repositories to use the FDOs. And FDOs and PIDs is in different gratitude. So uh, I actually, there is um, no uh, infra e e infrastructure for FDO only. We combine these FDOs, the PIDs, in specific areas. Um, in different uh, areas, they have different requirements for the FDOs. So we have to work with the industrial data uh, experts to build their own um, digital objects. And for the uh, there is a science uh, data bank in China, which is for the open science. For the uh, research data, so, um, we uh, see that uh, there is not much more uh, requirements for building their own FDOs. In this uh, stage, uh, they would like to know the same uh, as you raised the question. So the, what's the specific instructions for the um, research data repository experts to use the FDOs? And there is it's, um, Chinese saying that uh, we should break the last miles between the um, users and uh, between the services. So I think that uh, we should uh, work together on this point to make the FDO more understandable by the data repositories. Yeah, okay. Hello, I'm Rita Beltane from the National Library of Finland. I'm really new to this this world, so I'm trying to catch do a catch up and from the cultural heritage collections point of view and thinking them as a research data and um, initially thought that I'm probably just missing some basic information that is clear to every one of you related to these operations but apparently isn't so so um, if I'm thinking uh, the, what are the operations? That was my question and if I'm thinking of cultural heritage data let's say let I have a image from a certain place. Um, cultural heritage organizations provide quite good metadata perhaps into it. It might even co con contain a coordinate where it's from, and then it might have file or se several images related to that place. So are those operations kind of like 
uh, what the repository allows to do for that file, or is it is it for example if it's in a uh, kind of aggregated place where there are multiple of sort of data coming from multiple organizations and and for example the metadata would allow to you to through APIs uh, request what other objects there exist in this service related to this location so is that an operation so how should I be thinking this that because we are very far from sort of providing this information from uh, through APIs probably, but how 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 I should start to say into this cultural heritage organizations, hey, you need to start to think about it from the, this angle. <laughs> Do you want to answer this question? Answer our question. So uh, I'm uh, Marta from Massa Botanic Garden, but also involved in the DISCO research infrastructure. And so in DISCO, we are implementing fair digital objects for specimens. So basically each specimen becomes a fair digital object and the operations that you can do on a specimen is mainly kind of annotations. For example, uh, someone re-identifies a specimen to another species. This is an annotation that comes to your fair digital object and then can flow back to the institution, for example, to update the, the the data on the on the specimens itself, but it can also be like extra genetic information when sequencing was being done on that specimen, like really just a kind of annotation system. But I'm not the expert, so you should talk to Sharif Islam uh, if you want to know more. <laughs> just just to follow up here a little bit in the the power in the FDO, I really is in these operations and being able to create custom operations. Now, operations can be very simple things like the CRUD operations that you're used to, the create, update, delete, um, um, or read, um, or they can be more advanced. One of the uh, also very basic operations would be a list what operations I can do on this digital object that would give you some idea of what operations exist that can be executed on that object. So it, it's, uh, um, and then of course you can create custom uh, um, operations based on the needs of the users of that repository. Thank you. I think there's another question here. Um, just to, to, just two oh. short answers uh, to questions I heard. What is the benefit of fair digital objects? In the meanwhile, we are happy that people are using repositories and storing the data <laughs> there. Um, but we have lots of individual repositories, Nomad, we have uh, these repositories, we have Zenodo, all of them have APIs, they are somehow different. Whenever I have a DOI or a PID pointing to a data set, I'm landing where? On a landing page. Suppose you have millions of objects you would like to retrieve, so you need something in uh, uh, representation which is independent of the landing pages because all of them are only humanly actionable and they are different. Secondly, types and operations. Each fair digital object is associated and has one type. You can now and this is currently under development, it's not finalized yet. The idea is that a certain type has also some operations capabilities. So for example, if you have an image, you can view it, you can move it, you can maybe rotate it or something like that. And the operations are associated and bound to the types itself. So you have a system where you can implement operations easily. Yes. So I have a very quick comment. So Tomasz Mixate, uh, whenever I come to any meeting about FDOs here or somewhere else, I'm always getting confused after some time, like our colleague about the operations, about what is given, what is fixed, and what is still in research. And and, <laughs> and, and basically my question is like, what is the what do you see? Maybe this is to the chairs mostly. What can we do as a working group or interest group here at RDA? What should be the topic of the next meetings? So what should we work on? So what is still to be researched and what is fixed, yeah? Actually, maybe. Uh... Um, yeah, so just when you said uh, the um, FTOs, like you go on the landing page, but there's also like 
for example, fair signposting. So uh, how does it relate to the uh, to the FTOs, if at all? It's an implementation technique. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Lars Muller from Pangea here. I was also uh, I wanted to comment on uh, if landing pages are only for human interactions, because um, we have uh, schema.org markup. Uh, so um, basically, there's also <clears throat> a lot of operations and uh, implemented information that is uh, that you can use on uh, yeah that machines can use to um, yeah interpret what resource is presented. So um, I'm try still to understand what the advantages are of a fair digital object uh, object um, in relation to uh, markup landing pages. So maybe you can help me with that. I think maybe mark, uh, markup landing page is just one uh, kind of implementation of the FD of interoperability of the FDO. FDO maybe it's a concept model or some uh, conceptual layers. Uh, if we, one of the method you can, it's a, only a pathway to realize that you can use markup uh, landing page, and you can also use other kind of uh, semantic interoperability method. You can use ontology. You can use some uh, different schema or other kind of solution. Uh, it's my opinion. Mm -hmm. And there's Maggie on the. Oh, here's me. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah so uh, I just would like to add one thing to this uh, thing about signposting or where do you put this machine actionability uh, layer or information. Um, if you have it at the level of a PID registry uh, by already in the type uh, definition and in the diff other metadata you have in the profile there, then you only need to look up, make one call to retrieve that information and, and sort of, for instance, as Rob was saying, give me a list of, of uh, associated operations uh, or possible operations. Otherwise, you would have to first resolve the the, the uh, PID, you get the pointer to the landing page, and then you have to interact with that landing page information, maybe in several steps. So uh, I think uh, one real advantage here is that you minimize the number of calls you potentially have to make in order to make that first decision. Can I use this uh, digital object now for, for the intention that I had in mind or not? And that, for instance, could include that you see the license or the, the uh, usage uh, um, agreements already at, at the first core level. And then you can immediately say, no, I'm not allowed to use this for what I, I had in mind. And then you skip on to the next object. OK, thank you, Maggie. Sorry. Uh... Oh, sorry, so I just want to make, um, so my name is Nedge Lorettberg, I'm from the Research Data Alliance Europe. I want to make a merciless plug for a project we have called Tiger. Some of you are already Tigers, I see in the room. Um, this is a great meeting, I don't know, um, from following up from the previous question about next steps for this interest group, if this were to have some potential for working group and all these challenges that you're talking, we can support that in Tiger. So we have grants available, possibly even third-party grants to for adopters and for interoperability projects, something like that within this group. So thanks for my time, merciless plug. Okay, back to you. Thank you, Chairs. Thanks a lot. Thank you for all. And uh, I think it's a, a good opportunity to exchange uh, ideas with us, uh, with you, and welcome you to attend our future meeting and uh, to show you show your opinions and your work future. And uh, we will think about what we have discussed today. And that's all. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Man.